Um, thank you so much for joining us today. We are so lucky to have Gwendolyn Van Passion as our garden designer and writer. She's worked internationally re with renowned British landscape designer and author, John Brooks, MBE, on a major multi-year project in Millbrook, New York. She helped him write his memoir, A Landscape Legacy, and is now chairman of the John Brooks Denman's Foundation, which she co-founded in 2017. The John Brooks Denman's Foundation is dedicated to per perpetuating John Brooks' design legacy and to the renovation and preservation of Denman's gardens, his garden in West Sussex. She currently owns and runs Denman's, which includes a plant center and retail space. She is also a contributor to the Georgetown Dish, a daily news entertaining site, writing occasional articles about gardening and garden design. Ms. Van Passion has compiled and edited How to Design Your Garden, a book of writings of John Brooks published by Pimpernel Press. And there it is. That's the same great cover, great handy book. Um, we will do some questions at the end. And as I said, Gwendolyn's sharing her screen with you. So welcome to her garden. This is a beautiful place to visit. And I'm sure she'll give you some hints about how to get there as she goes on. Thank I'm you gonna... so much, Kathleen. And everyone for asking me to join you. It's a great pleasure to join you, even though I'm in Sussex, it's a great pleasure to be back at the Deadman's Public or the Public Library in trying to get a video to go at the same time. Um, at the Darien Public Library. I love the Darien Public Library. Uh, so I will tell you about that where Deadman's is. We're 55 miles south of London. We're five miles north of the English Channel and we're nestled at the south of, at the foot of the South Downs. The climate's really mild, and I'm told it's the sunniest part of England, but we wouldn't know that today. It's 60 and rainy. Denman's is not your typical English garden by any stretch. It's small. It's only about four and a half acres. It's post-war, and it's pretty unique. At its core, it's a peaceful, contemporary country garden with an unconventional layout designed by one of Britain's most influential landscape designers, so please clear your minds of any preconceptions you have about the traditional English garden. First, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the garden's history, then a bit about John, and a bit about how to design a garden, the book of essays and lectures that I edited last year, and how it's influenced us here at Denman's as we restore the garden. The garden was started by an unknown plants woman named Joyce Robinson who lived here from 1947 to 1996. John didn't move here until 1980 and he lived here until his death in 2018. They overlapped 16 years. Mrs. Robinson was born in 1903, just down the road from Denman's. Her father was a farmer. And this area of England was not known just for agriculture, but also it was covered by commercial glass houses back in the day. John Brooks was a northerner. He was born in 1933, so he was 30 years younger than she was, and he was born in Durham. Although, and although he was interested in having his own farm, he was when he was growing up. By the time he moved to Sussex, he was already a well-established garden designer and author. Despite their different backgrounds and ages, they had a lot in common, which is why Denman's is so beautiful and tranquil. Let me first say a few words about Mrs. Robinson. Joyce Hilda Langmead married Captain James Hubert Robinson, a good friend of her parents, who was 25 years her senior. It was a bit of a scandal. It was 1925, just after the First World War, and her mother was really worried about the number of years her daughter might be alone, but men were in short supply at the time. He was a well-trained grower. He came to this part of Sussex in 1901. He was aged 22 and he started a nursery business and produce shop from which he sold both wholesale and retail produce and goods, some homemade, some imported. Mrs. Robinson, or Mrs. J.H. as she was known, started gardening as a child. For the first 21 years of her marriage, she grew produce for sale in the family business, along with flowers and shrubs. During the Second World War, like the rest of British gardeners, she grew vegetables and fruits in what she called her wartime garden. 1946, oh, she was passionate about growing and propagating things and sought out no local nurserymen and women who could teach her more. This is well before you could go to a garden center, as they call here, or a nursery. 
you had to learn how to propagate your own plants and you swapped with your friends and your neighbors. After the Second World War, the Robinsons decided it was time to move to a place where they could really settle and where she could live on after he was gone. The Westergate estate was only a mile up the road from the family business and it was for sale. It had all they were looking for, 70 acres, outbuildings, walled garden, conservatories, cottages. The manor house had been requisitioned during the war by the WAAF, the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. I can't say that easily. The women who worked at nearby Tangmere Air Base from which the Spitfires flew. By 1946, when it was put on the market though, the property was pretty badly neglected. Its potential, however, was not lost on the Robinsons. They bought the estate, sold the manor house off the following year. It's now a care home. At Easter that year, in 1947, the Robinsons finally moved into what was the former gardener's cottage. They named it Denman's after Lord Denman, who had owned the estate in the late 1980s. Because Westergate House had been requisitioned, the, the garden was also in a terrible condition. Sending Spitfires off to defend the nation had trumped keeping up the property. Putting it back to rights proved an enormous challenge, but, and the couple spent years burning rubbish, renovating, and planting their new farm. Eventually, they sold soft fruits, vegetables, and cut flowers, most of which was sent to Covent Garden Market on the evening train. In time, there were chickens, pigs, and cows. They had a dairy. It wasn't until the 1950s that Mrs. Robinson finally thought she could begin to garden for her own pleasure. As Denman's is on the south facing slope and has a moderate climate with alkaline, well drained soil, she found she could grow many semi tropical plants, so she experimented a good deal. Her education having been interrupted by the war, she resumed visiting nurseries, as she said, botanical gardens. RHS shows at Westminster and reading and learning all I could from growers and nurserymen. She became acquainted with some of the prominent horticultural figures of the day, and her knowledge of plants and plant material and growing was epic. After JHR died in 1958, she kept the farm and dairy businesses and the garden going. In 1969, she traveled to Greece for what proved to be a garden-changing and life-changing cruise. She kept a record of her cruise in this small, innocuous-looking little diary, which is worth its weight being gold to us, for it records her impressions of the stop she made on the 10th of May, 1969. That's the one that changed the garden here forever. By far the longest of her entries at only three pages, she starts, a wonderful day I shall never forget. She was writing about the short stop at the island of Delos, the mythological birthplace of Apollo, which features Doric temples and amphitheater, houses and mo with mosaic floors, and the famous Terrace of the Lion statues, but none of that really interested in her. She wrote that from the ship, quote, the island looks so much like Scotland with small crofts and sheep, but when they got there and landed on shore, she said, it was all so different and so much softer and flowers, flowers all the way to the top, hundreds of steps to the temple and flowers and lizards and butterflies, just covered with color, poppies, linum, status, mullines trailing up and around urns and steps and pillars. She added, I was the last one to get into the boat and I did not want to leave. Whether it was an aha moment or whether it was simply planted the seed, pun intended, by the time she returned to England, she knew she'd found the planting medium she had been seeking. The following year in 1970, she retired from farming and started her first gravel garden at Denman's. She was not the only English gardener to be inspired by Delos, however. In the 1930s, Vita Sackville West and Harold Robinson had returned to Sissinghurst from Delos, determined to replicate a Greek landscape with broken iconic ionic columns and bits of statuary. But it was an unsuccessful, largely because the soil and the climate were wrong for the plants that they were trying to grow. Recently, however, the English designer Dan Pearson has recreated their vision at Sissinghurst, but that's another story. <laughs> 
Mrs. Robinson's intention was entirely different. She set out to create a garden using the gravel in her own style and that felt at home in her Sussex landscape. She was very particular about the type of gravel she wanted. It had to blend with the brick, flint, and other stonework at Benny's. And she finally settled on gravel from, dredged from a nearby harbor. We still use that same type of, type of gravel today. She knew she didn't have a time to look after a conventional garden or herb garden, so she chose plants that would self-sow. And by selecting plants that varied in height and bloom time, she achieved the effect she had fallen in love with on Delos. Naturalistic soft groupings of plants that spontaneously popped up where they pleased, which she edited by pulling out those that were too rampant. She soon had a long flower se flowering season and herbs all the herbs she needed. And as she hoped, the, the garden was low maintenance and she could walk, as she said, dry shod on wet days through the garden. Pleased with her first gravel experiment in the walled garden, she went to work on the west side of the property in front of the cottage and down the nut walk, which led to the cottage where her daughter, her mother had lived and where her daughter's house was across the street. Soon she had a gravel circuit that surrounded the whole of the south lawn of her cottage and connected her with the, gravel, with the walled garden again so she could walk dry shod. Combined in places with brick and York stone paving, the gravel walks incorporated, incorporated islands of plantings as well as lawn. As she had done in the walled garden, she let the perennials and annuals self sow into the gravel among the existing plantings, creating that naturalistic look she loved. In 1974, she started Denman's plants and sold plants that she grew here on site. And finally, in 1977, she sold her Guernsey cows, bringing up a cow paddock at the bottom of the property. She wrote, here was another challenge, another canvas. I thought of nothing else for weeks. I walked by it by day and by night and planned so many different enchantments and gardens on that piece of ground. The idea came quite suddenly. Why not gravel streams or riverbeds? Again, her inspiration came from nature, but this time from the local rivers, the winterborns of the South Downs that naturally go dry in the summertime. She decided to create two riverbeds that flowed down this gentle slope where the paddock had been, past the remnants of the orchard to the bottom of the garden where they would terminate in a dry water hole. At the age of 73, in October of 1977, Mrs. Robinson clambered on a tractor and began her three-year project. The result was nothing less than land art. By this time, she had also opened the garden to the public for charity, including the National Garden Scheme, which raises money for causes like cancer research. This brings us to John Brooks, who discovered Denman's in 1973 through the NGS. He was bringing his students for a visit and fell in love with the garden's originality and Mrs. Robinson's naturalistic planting style and innovative use of materials, especially the gravel. He loved the garden's relaxed peacefulness and was impressed by the successful way Mrs. Robinson worked with rather than against the limitations of the location. Her brilliant plant associations delighted him. Above all, he always used to say that he was attracted to Denman's because it wasn't trying to be something it wasn't. By this time, John was a really well-known garden designer and author here in Britain. He'd been the first independent garden designer to show an exhibition garden at the Chelsea Flower Show. The year was 1962, 60 years ago this spring, and by, and by that time he was still only 29 years old. An iconoclast by nature, his design was unconventional because the garden was not about plants. It included plants, of course, but instead the garden was about how people could use their gardens as an extension of their homes rather than as a showcase for horticultural treasure. It had included art and modernist furniture and different kinds of pot and pots and water. Hard to imagine now, but in 1960s Britain, his ideas were revolutionary. And controversial though it was, he still managed to win the Flora Silver. He was a modernist with unique, idea, unique and outspoken views on garden and landscape design. 
he was less interested in horticulture and past garden tradition than he was in creating affordable, stylish, low maintenance gardens that reflected the user's lifestyle and needs. John's first book, A Room Outside, was published in 1969. He presented the idea that the garden should be thought of as an outdoor room, and it gave ample design and practical advice like choosing an installed hardscape, the importance of soil. For him, a garden should be about the people who use them. It was a concept that was put forth by designers whom he admired on the continent in America, but it was far from the norm here in Britain. Nevertheless, Room Outside became a staple in the libraries of architects and landscape architects alike. He wasn't the first person to think about these ideas. He wasn't the first person to experiment, but he was the one who popularized them through his teaching, writing, television appearances, and radio interviews. Although no one had yet really heard of gravel gardening per se, in the 1960s, John and other designers in Britain on the continent and on the continent had been experimenting with gravel in posh town gardens where grass grew poorly and the modern lifestyle limited the ability of clients to care for their gardens. And if you had a lawn in a small town garden, where did you hide the mower? In the early 1970s, John designed three Chelsea garden show gardens with the for the Financial Times of London, with working with the brilliant huntsman and writer Robin Lane Fox, who's one of my personal all-time heroes. In the early 70s, uh, let's see, they made a gravel garden in the 1971 garden, which depicted a town garden, writing that, quote, in town grass can be messy. It is always troublesome. Thus, to save labor and money, we have no lawn. Instead, plants have strayed into the contrasting spaces of gravel and paving as if they have seated themselves in. We feel that gravel deserves wider use. It is bold, labor-free, and a potential home for house plants and so forth, which like to be sunk out of doors in summer. Flowers, after all, do not only belong in beds. It was two years later that he first visited Denman's and met the indomitable Mrs. Robinson, who was well into her gravel garden experiments. And what she was doing was unique and to John, very exciting. He was attracted by how her plants were group, quote, grouped and contrasted with glorious disarrays that seemed out of control in their exuberance, adding that, quote, to say Denman's is a wild garden would not be correct for it is managed along the very unusual lines and structured to the nth degree. John hinted to Mrs. Robinson that he might be interested in moving his practice to Denman's, but she wasn't having it. So instead in 1977, he accepted an offer to start an interior design school in Tehran. His timing was terrible. His first and only 18 month interior design course was sandwiched between the departure of the Shah and the arrival of the Ayatollah. Returning to England in 1979, he found himself unemployed and looking for a place to live. Having decided to restart his landscape design practice and to establish his own school of garden design, John made a bold dash to, to Denman's. By now, Mrs. Robinson was increasingly reliant on a golf cart to get around. Her gardener, Bertie, was two, was showing his age. So she agreed to let John set up to convert the stable block into his home and studio and to set up the garden school, design school and to take over management of the garden. So John renovated the stables and named it Clock House after the clock where Denman had had installed there in the late 1890s. In 1980, he moved in and opened the Clock House School of Garden Design. And over the four, next four years, he also took over management of the garden. John used to tell me that it took him 10 years to feel the garden was his, and it took her 10 years to relinquish control of it. I find that easy to believe. Mrs. J.H. had been working on the garden for nearly 40 years when this upstart came over. One can imagine it was quite hard to let it go. And he had definite ideas about the changes he wanted to make. One can imagine that he wanted some kind of a showpiece as he restarted his practice and he started his design school. I don't have any correspondence between the two, but I suspect it was not always an easy transition. 
I don't know that the following 16 years were necessarily always smooth. Both were feisty, opinionated, stubborn, determined, and forward thinking. Nevertheless, as the years went by, the garden began to take on a timeless and new style. John began by revising the herb garden and the walled garden and reshaping some of the beds Mrs. Robinson had created, though he left the plantains and the riverbeds intact. On the south side of the garden, he reshaped her areas of long grass surrounded by lawn, forming, transforming them into organic shapes that better complemented the organic shapes of the riverbeds. Then he introduced new colors, including orange to the color scheme. It is likely they collaborated on some changes, especially the revision of the garden in front of the cottage in 1982. It was then that the small round pond was built in front of the sunroom that Mrs. J.H. had had built in 1979. I think it was John's idea to repeat the curve of the sunroom with a circular pond, and that he designed the shape of the, the surrounding gravel garden and lawns to sweep from the conservatory on one side of the cottage to the top of the netwalk on the other side using these strong, bold lines. In this way, he integrated pool, lawn, and adjacent gravel walks into an overall composition. The plantings, on the other hand, were and probably remain very much hers, as these photos should suggest. While John loved the dry riverbeds, he felt, always felt that they should terminate in something positive rather than the dry water hole she created. He was thinking of pond. In 1984, he finally persuaded her to build one with Anthony Archer Wills, the great water garden designer. You may recognize him from Animal Planet's The Pool Master Show. From various oral accounts, persuading Mrs. J.H. that a pond was necessary did take a little doing. The area in front of John's new home was a car park when he moved in. It was separated from the rest of the garden by a drive that was used by the, the lorries to pick up produce going from, Covent, from the farm to Covent Garden and local shops. She had never gardened there. He wrote that he made Clock House Garden as different as he could from Mrs. Robinson's garden. It included gravel, of course, but its lines are linear in contrast to those he created elsewhere in the garden, and the plantings were far more architectural. A lot were semi-tropicals. Over his, over his terrace, he also built a simple catalog very reminiscent of the ones that he introduced to London Gardens he was working in in the 1960s. It was intended to give the verisimilitude of enclosure rather than shade. Sometime in the early part of the century, it was taken down. We rebuilt it last spring. A sketch of the clockhouse garden that he did later, and which I just recently found, really shows how angular this small part of the garden is. And although he never told me so, I believe that John was very much inspired by the abstract artist Pete Mondrian, whose paintings, like those of other abstract painters, had a profound influence on how John thought of that garden design. By contrast, the rest of the garden was inspired by the Californian landscape designer, Thomas Church, as well as the Brazilian landscape architect Roberto Burley Marx, whose works include, among other things, the sidewalk in Rio. So the walk on the right is my attempt to show you why it is reminiscent of Burley Marx. I hope that conveys it. <laughs> in the 1996, the 50th anniversary of Mrs. Robinson's arrival at Denny's, and just months before she passed away, a writer wrote that, quote, both Mrs. Robinson and John Brooks are constantly asked who did what in the garden. Mrs. Robinson put in the bones and constructed the dry streams, and John Brooks has taken on where she has left off. It was a smooth transition with inevitably some changes, but always maintaining that particular mood of gentle disarray. In the years after her death, John continued to revise, and in his memoir, this is where I'm supposed to hold this up, Kathleen told me, there you are, A Landscape Legacy, which was published just in April, just a few months after he died, John wrote that in general, I simplified the design of the garden, all the while learning a great deal from Mrs. Robinson's paintings. People would 
familiar with John's work will recognize his iconic blue benches. And he also added various bits of topiary, jar, olive jars, sculpture, and other touches to the garden. In 2016, he told me that, quote, Joyce described her garden as being glorious disarray. I, with my designer's eye, have tended to give it structure so that disarray is overlaid with a plan. And my disarray, I would suggest, is essentially different to Joyce's in that my interest is essentially shape, texture, and form before flowers and color. It is controlled disarray. In addition to sculpture and water, John introduced architectural plantings throughout the garden. What I love about the way he uses architectural plantings is that they reinforce the lines of the garden. Boxwood balls like this one complement the curvy walks and clipped boxwood cubes work with his linear paving patterns and beds. This is one of the garden's unique attributes, the way the plantings reinforce the garden's layout in the third dimension. And the architectural plantings really complement Mrs. Robinson's naturalistic planting style, although they also contrast with them very well. The strength of their combined plantings persists through all the seasons of the year, even in winter, which is my favorite time here, bizarrely enough. Denmas has a wonderful winter structure that includes colored stems, evergreen shrubs, flowering shrubs, variegated shrubs, some clipped, some not clipped, all enriched by winter blooming perennials and bulbs and the fragrance in the garden is heaven. In the years before John died, Denman suffered from a lengthy business dispute that nearly spelled the end of this marvelous place. When the dispute was finally settled in late 2017, he had full control over the garden for the first time in years. As a result of the long running business dispute, however, the garden was in a terribly neglected state and John was determined to put it back to rights. Although the bones of the garden and the plants were still here, the weeds and overgrown trees and shrubs were unbelievable. Fences were dilapidated and the lower pond was an impenetrable weedy mess. Consequently, the instant he knew the dispute was over in November of 2017, John and our head gardener, Graham Best, attacked the garden with a ferocious intensity, though at 84, he was growing increasingly frail. Looking back, it seems to me that he sensed his time was running out. By the time I returned from my Christmas holiday in January of 2018, he and Graham had been going at it hammer and tongs, or should I say secateurs and saws. There were mountains of branches, shrub, rubbish piled everywhere by the cottage, by the entrance to the walled garden. The buildings were in a terrible condition. Ceilings were falling, rubbish was everywhere. The filth was unimaginable. It was hard to know sometimes where to start. We were brokenhearted when John died in March that year. We lost our friend and mentor, and he died without giving us any kind of idea of a roadmap for the future, and with the daunting task of reopening the garden, which had been closed by the former business partner over a year earlier. Bereft, but determined, we continued to clear weeds and cut back what was obviously uh, overgrown. And somehow by June of 2018, four years ago, a few days after John's memorial, we were able to reopen the garden to the public. It wasn't impeccable and it wasn't perfect, but it looked like it had a future. Since then, our focus has been much the same, but the effort gets increasingly complicated. Now we have to take a more reflective and deliberative approach. As there are a few plans of the garden, but this phase requires looking at old photos for guidance. And we're fortunate to have been given a lot of, not only photos, but uh, writings from Mrs. Robinson's family. It's also been amazing the number of people who have come forward and sh shared their stories with us, and even some who have not come in, but they have sent us old photos by email. Those are the ones that have great on them, which are hugely valuable. We've also been lucky to have a few drawings of Jones um, among his papers. And the best part is a reward for all our hard work. We've discovered plants we knew, never knew we had. The first were snowdrops. John didn't like snowdrops, so there weren't any until he died. And then suddenly they started appearing at cloth house, down by the pond, around the cottage, and in other areas. 
many other bulbs have also appeared, glucogen daffodils, hyacinths, bluebells. We also discovered roses, mahonias, viburnums, unusual vines that were covered up by overgrown shrubs and trees. We even discovered a terrestrial orchid growing in the gravel by the cottage. That's on the lower left. We began our restoration projects in 2018. The first big one was the pond, which we rebuilt according to a drawing we found after John died. Anthony was here last month and helped us tweak both ponds. Our current restoration project is the recreation of the gravel garden in front of the cottage using photos we have gathered from the years between 1982 and 1996. Last June, we restored the shape of the gravel garden, which John had altered in 2018, and we reinstalled the gravel. Luckily, last May, we were given a 1983 thesis, thesis by an American woman written in, called Denman's, a design and a maintenance report. It's full of valuable information and it includes a plant list for the garden with sort of section by section layout of where, where everything was. We've also been restoring the garden by clock house. There were tons of weeds here I could never get on top of. And when a huge formium at the end of the terrace fell over one day, we discovered that it was actually eight, four feet longer than we thought it was. I started chopping the choisia and the jasmine, only to discover Mahonia, Pittosporum, and Pyracantha hidden in the overgrown mess. For the first time, we could see the complete pattern of the bricks that John had used to edge his gravel garden in around 1980. Mondrian was back. So in the four years since John has died, we've been all about restoration and rejuvenation of what has now become a registered grade two historic garden. It's part archeology, span part very hard work and part magic. So this brings me back to the book of essays that I edited and how it has influenced the work. And as you can see, my copy is dog-eared. It is a collection of 50 essays, lectures and lessons, some of which have never been published. In 2016 and 2017, I was working with John on his mem memoir, Landscape Legacy, and I came across several notebooks and files containing John's articles and lectures. One caught my eye, eye and I scrolled it away up here in my office for a rainy day. That rainy day came a few years later during the first lockdown. The notebook was our lectures, 1990, 1990s, and I dove in hoping to reread the lectures he had given when I took his master class at the New York Botanical Garden in 93 and again in 95. Well, those, those specific lectures weren't there. There were others that were very much along the same lines that I found very worthwhile reading and rereading. And there were others that were similarly compelling about land art, the importance of linking site to garden, how to look at a landscape, how to work with a client, how to work with a designer, and even how to hide the bareness of rose bushes in winter. What I especially love about them, many of which were in draft form when, when we found them, is that they're very little edited and his voice is clearly audible. Anyone familiar with John's humor, warmth, and sometimes sharp now will recognize it. It seemed to me that these pieces should be available to anyone interested in gardening garden design, and horticulture. So I took advantage of the last lockdown to compile the book. John's philosophy of design is timeless and it remains unquestionably relevant. He was so far ahead of his time. Since completing the book, I think about John's words often as I walk through the garden. For instance, one of the garden speeches is the use of differential mowing, meaning that some of the grass is cut short like a normal garden lawn and other parts are left longer. John used this technique to create patterns in the grass. So three things come to mind. First is that John thought of a garden at, garden's layout as a collage of shapes. Here, John created the patterns in the grass playing shape against shape. With this in mind, we've spent a good deal of time in the past couple of years recreating the shapes we laid out both in the long grass and in the shapes of the beds. The second thing is that it permitted him to use longer grass in a structured way. So Kathleen and I were just talking about Chelsea last week and how a lot of the gardens seemed really 
shaggy as people are trying to show that they can do the best meadow. The meadows can look really messy. Who wants a mess in their garden? But John approached it by creating it in a, in a clearly defined shape. So this is our example, which is the meadow. It's an area of large, it's sort of a large organic shape in the lawn with a mown path around it. Although originally the grass was permitted to grow meadow height, in the years before he died, John kept it slightly longer than the mown grass, which I thought was a little dull. So I let it grow. Is you just have to see this. In 2018, after John died, we noticed daisies coming up in the long grass, so we let them bloom before we cut it. And since then, we've let the meadow grow to meadow height every year. We've been amazed at the pollinators and other flying creatures that are just attracted. And the third thing that we use here is this rule of thirds, and that helps us decide how long the grass should be kept in what area of the garden. Your clock house in the cottage where there is also longer grass, that's the first third. He, we, it's kept relatively short, it's more formal. The orchard, which is the second third, is slightly longer than that, a little bit shaggier. And the, the third is the meadow, which it grows meadow height until it looks ratty and that's when we mow it. Overall, John was very concerned about conservation and the environment much earlier than many others were. And those concerns consistent, were consistent with Mrs. Robinson's view who wrote about meadows in her book, Glorious Disarray. So we think very hard about our plant choices that we're making. We believe that both John and Mrs. Robinson would make plant choices now that would reflect the changing climate. And we will do the same thing. Some of the essays that lay out John's approach to connecting the garden to the landscape and working with native plants, while other lectures are those he gives to his students about how to design a garden, how to pick plants, how to look at a garden and the landscape, and even how to work with clients or homeowners, for homeowners, how to work with a designer and an architect. Perhaps most of all, we consider day-to-day -day John's guidance on the use of plants, except especially with respect to structure, which really helps us determine not just which shrubs to keep back, but sometimes which shrubs to take out or trees. John taught us how important it was to keep plants in proportion. So we defer to John's hierarchy as we reverse engineer areas that are overgrown. When approaching a shrub that seems to have grown too large, we step back and think about John's comments about structural planting and sight lines before deciding whether it should be cut back or removed. So an example of this is um, here. It's not a great slide. And the reason it's not a great slide was because it's the only slide I took of this area because it just wasn't beautiful. On the left side, you can see a dwarf sequoia, just the edge of it, it's variegated, but it was 18 to 20 feet tall. Next to it was a huge Iliagnus that was even bigger and a cornus moss that was even bigger than the, the sequoia. We cut the sequoia back massively, removed the cornus moss and the Iliagnus has also been seriously cut back. Then we cleaned up the lines, just as I said before, because the lines in this had gotten quite eroded. And suddenly the space is open and the sight lines are stunning. So you can see the stump of the cornus moss on the left. Um, and you can see how this whole scene has been transformed. Now I take photos of it all the time. This is a photo of it coming from the other side. Um, it just shows you how the lines take your eye down. These, these shapes that he's playing with take you down into a direction and then they bring you back up again on the other side. Photos really don't do it justice. You'll just have to come and see what I mean. I think I've gone on long enough. As Kathleen knows, I could talk about Denman's till the cows come home. I could talk about John and Mrs. Robinson and how they work until the cows come home, but I will spare you. Thank you for listening to John's story and why his design philosophy still matters. I love to talk about, I love to talk about Denman's and it's always great to have an audience that's interested, but most of all, I hope you'll come to Denman's and see for yourself what we're doing. Bravo, bravo, what a beautiful show. And I can testify Denman's is well worth the trip.
Um, one of the questions someone sent in earlier was when visiting Denman's, what else should you put on your agenda? Oh, we're in such a great location because we're, we're, as I said, 55 miles south of London, and we're right between two amazing towns, Arundel, which has got the Arundel Castle, great garden and a great head gardener there that's done so many great things there. And um, Chichester, which is to the other side where there's a small bishop's garden and there's West Dean, and then there's just a number of other gardens. What you should do is you should go to the RHS website and look at the partner gardens um, for this area. We're an RHS partner garden, but there are other, some really other great ones like Board Hill, Leonardsley, Nyman's. So come and visit. My it's personal someone... favorite though is on the other, actually about two and a half hours away in um, past Portsmouth and, and Southampton called Abbotsbury, which is a semi-tropical garden that's just amazing and has an amazing plant nursery. Uh, we have a question from Eve asking, do you live there full time? I do. So that blue bench straight ahead of you, um, if you take a hard left there, is where I live. Um, I live in Clock House. Um, let's see, what else do we have? We have questions. Um, if clearing a large area with invasives, what is your advice? I will tell you what John would tell you to do. Um, he would tell you to go walk through the landscape and look, take your camera and take photos of things that you think are beautiful, the combinations of plants you think are beautiful, figure out what your soil is and what it can support. And you know, when you walk around a landscape around where you live, you'll very quickly see what grows really well there. And that's where you should start. Um, I think also you have to decide what your space is for. John would say, make a list. What are you going to use that space for? What does it mean to you? What, what matters to you? And what do you definitely not want? The last thing I think he'd say is make it big and bold. Um, in addition to that question, they said ground cover, mulch, or gravel? Question mark. Well, I would go for gravel. <laughs> the interesting thing about gravel is a really good question because um, probably the most famous gravel garden here um, in England is owned by a woman named Beth Chata, who, who converted a car park in 1992 into a gravel garden. And she's on a more clay-based soil than we are. She's also further north. Um, and her claim to fame is partly that she never waters it, which I think has probably been really hard the last few very dry summers. But we take a slightly different approach. We've got lots of different kinds of soil in the garden. So what we grow in our gravel areas is really dictated by the soil beneath it and also how much sun it gets. So uh, gravel's great. You can walk on it. You can, um, you can plant into it. You can put furniture on it. The other thing to know about gravel is you always want to put a good base down. Do not put landscape cloth down or some kind of membrane. It will you, you will regret it because the roots of weeds will grow into it. You'll start pulling them out and disturbing the membrane and get holes in it and it'll get weedier and weedier. So you want to put a really good base down and roll it um, and then put the oh. gravel on top of it. So you mean roll soil? No, you, you would like, you would um, almost like you would lay a base for a dry patio where you put down bluestone dust or something that you could tamp down and it, it get hard. Um, things will self sow into it, but and then when you plant in it, as we did this spring with the walled garden, you just kind of remove what you want to, you know, where you want to plant something, remove some of it and put your plant in, put some compost around it, and then put the gravel right back over it. Okay, so that keeps the, the invasives out of there. It, well, no, you just always have, you have to pull those invasives by hand. <laughs> We have a program Thursday night on invasives. So for everyone who's haunted by them, join us at 7 p.m. Um, here's another two more questions came in. Which part of the garden is your favorite and why? Well, I have. So we have this huge greenhouse. It's about a seventh of an acre. And it's my favorite place because I can spend hours in there with nobody bothering me, just puttering around. Um, I... John and I used to sit on the blue benches in the walled garden at five o'clock. We'd pour, pour him two with a whiskey for him, a whiskey for me, which was always hard because I always had to go work afterwards. Take the chips and the pug down and sit in the walled garden because the, the light was so beautiful. Um, and on the, I love sitting in the conservatory on a rainy day. Sounds great. That same um, 
person asked, how often do you need to add more gravel annually? No, 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 no. Um, we do top it up from time to time, but it, it lasts for a surprisingly long time. Um, so when, when we reopened the garden in uh, 2018, so four years ago, we re-graveled a lot of the paths and they haven't had to be re-graveled since then. That's great. Uh, let's see. Um, I noticed in the book that the verbascum was John's favorite plant. Do you have a favorite plant? I don't have a favorite plant. You don't. You Everyone's equal. I just, you know, that's why I love winter. I just think anything when, when it comes up and you see it for the first time that year, you just kind of go, oh, there you are again. So here we've got um, sort of two waves of cyclamen, sort of the autumn cyclamen in the spring. And I walk out and think, oh, there are their leaves, oh, there are their flowers. Isn't that lovely? And, you know, this morning, you know, walking through and seeing this little anemone is this, you know, sort of not the same species as the rest of the anemones. It's the serendipity and the way that the colors work and the way the shapes work that I really kind of think is wonderful. Yeah. You know, this, this walk, you know, this curved walk goes from really, you know, just a few things blooming in the wintertime, some primroses and things to sort of waves of bulbs. And you just see these color combinations and texture combinations. I just love it. Um, since you mentioned winter, someone asked, what was the orange plant in your winter slide? And it's also featured in the slide of the pond. It's orangey, sticky looking. It probably was a, um, is a kind of formium. Formium. I can look. Huh. Is there a common name for that? I barely know the Latin names, Kathleen. <laughs> you <laughs> know plenty of Latin names. For, for anybody who, who, who gardens in Connecticut, I would say 80% of the stuff doesn't bloom, which has been such a challenge uh. because I know all my Connecticut plants. I don't know all these plants, but um, it, it is that sort of, uh, I think it's a, a kind of formium that um, is a variegated. So it's the spiky ones. Yep. yep. Mostly are formiums. And um, it, it, I think we probably have three or four different species of them. The variegated ones are really lovely because they catch the light. You know, I think when you're thinking about doing a garden, there's some, you know, there's some plants that you want to use that those green and white or yellow and, and green leaves are so wonderful because it gives you the sense that there's sunlight even on a, a cloudy day. Mm, pretty. Uh, someone just wrote in, which plants really shine in the fall garden? And then under that, she has New Zealand flax, question mark. Um, I don't know the Latin name for New Zealand flax. I, what, here, what, one of the things that I love, and I don't know if it's hardy in Connecticut, is nephophia. It's K-N-I-P-H-O-F-I-A. They're different nephophias, and they, they have really spiky leaves year-round, which is great because you get that texture. And then you get, um, I think red hot poker is the, oh, the yeah. common name. Um, so we've got a lot of that, a lot of sedums, different kinds of sedums. Um, I know another thing you can grow in Connecticut at is, you know, the blue asters, Aster fractarii monk, which just looks amazing with, the, with some of the sedums. And they are wonderful. You know, they bloom for such a long time. We've used a lot of dahlias in the garden. Oh, they're so um, beautiful. Which I know that there's the Japanese um, beetle problem, but in our garden, like roses and other things we've got lots of roses we have over 50 kinds of roses but you would never say where's the rose garden the same thing with the dahlias there are touches of color throughout the beds but there's not a big clump of them so i think if you don't clump them maybe the beetles don't find them as easily um someone was asking they saw an iron support plant support in one of the slides do you have a resource for that i think it was a circular i Maybe oh, oh do you know what those are? Those are amazing. Um, the the source is Muntons, M-U-N-T-O-N-S. Um, if you can't find it, just email the office, office at denmans.org. I'll put that up. Okay. Um, um, and then uh, I could is Muntons, they they're made by a family. Um, that did a whole lot of other stuff. And then late in life, they decided to build these amazing flower supports. They've been in Chelsea, they've won trade stand awards in, in Chelsea. So we've bought these to hold up our hydrangeas. Yeah, they look and great. They, they look, they're sculptural. They look beautiful even in the wintertime. 
Um, more questions coming in. What type of wildlife do you get? Animals and pollinators? Question mark. Um, we have the most, uh, I think this might be one of my very favorite things about the garden, the most amazing birds. Um, we've got two different kinds of woodpeckers. We just had a family of woodpeckers fledge. So our, our, um, our bird feeders covered with woodpeckers all the time. We get fire crests, we've had gold crests, we've had chaffinches, we've had thrushes, you know, just all kinds of things. And I don't, I know if you remember this, when you woke up in the morning, when you were visiting, the bird song here is unbelievable. Um, we've got lots of different butterflies. We've got about five minutes after we filled the pond with, with water in 2018, and it was still this ghastly blue with this white lining that I think the pond guy put in just to drive me crazy. Um, it was full of, of what they call damselflies. So uh, what do we call them? Um, dragonflies, all kinds of things. Um, we've had tons of different kinds of bees. And one of the interesting things about the bees, I, I posted this on so social media a couple of weeks ago. We've got something called um, Ceanothus, which I think is California lilac. It's blue, really, really pretty. Mm. And it was covered one day, it was covered with, bum with honeybees, not a bumblebee to be seen. But all of the, the alliums in the, in the long grass and elsewhere through the garden were covered by bumblebees. So it was, it, it, you know, you, does that mean they like different things or they just don't like to play together? Um, we've got toads. We just pulled a toad out of our conservatory that had gotten lost down a little well. Um, hedgehogs, we're building a little dio, biodiversity walk where we think the hedgehogs live so that we can double down on um, hopefully attracting and, and maintaining them. So there's so much building going around us. We want to be a little haven for all these creatures. We do keep the, the we've got a deer fence to keep the deer out. That sounds familiar. Yeah. Foxes. Foxes, always foxes. Someone asked if starting a garden on a budget, a new garden, where would you start? Start oh. with the list. Start with the list of what you want from your garden. What is that space? all about and then you know come up with a list and then decide you know how you're going to break your project into pieces so usually you want to start right outside your back room you know your, your your door that that goes out to the garden if it's an extension of your home you want to be able to use that space first um if you read how to design a garden john gives a lot of tips about sort of the kinds of things you want to take into account you know, do you have children? Do you have a dog? Do you want to sit? One of my favorite quotes um, about John's 1960s garden was written sometime in the 80s about how people would be sort of surprised by his, his gardens, the, sort of the traditional British gardener, because, quote, I think it goes like this, you could, you could sit in a John Brooks garden, you could have a drinks party in it, and if you didn't like gardening, you could do very little gardening indeed. So he would say, if you don't like to garden much, put in your gravel, put in your paving and do a little bit of gardening. Yeah. Um, it, make it easy for yourself. It, another point he makes is don't fight your soil. If you fight your soil, you'll double the trouble. It'll make it so much harder for yourself. So that's why I go out and look at the landscape around you, look at what your neighbors are growing. That'll give you a clue as to what you might wanna do. Also make a um, list of what you don't want. Since you touched on a, making gardening easier, we have a question about how can you, how can you keep your garden manageable as you grow older and keep the labor down? Probably keep taking out bits of planted area and pave them, um, I would think. <clears throat> I remember when I was living in Connecticut, I just got so tired of that lawn that I, every year I added more and more Pakistander or Vinca just so I didn't have to have that lawn mode. But it looked great. I also didn't have to garden it. And it's usually pretty good at keeping the weeds out. So okay. what can you do to reduce that space? Um, how do you avoid mosquitoes if you have a water feature? Keep the water moving. Ah. We, so we, we have a restaurant area that we opened a restaurant when we first opened Denman's, but we closed it during COVID, but um, hope to reopen it. Somebody else was thinking about using this space. And there's a big water tank right outside of it. So when we had the health inspector come, he said that we had to keep that water moving to keep the mosquitoes out. 
So we have a little garden pump. You can get great solar pumps for that kind of stuff now. Oh, that's a great idea. Um, someone wrote in about what are your invasives? Oh, you know, I think about that a lot because I think, I think Britain is just a country full of invasives, period. And there's sort of two things. First of all, my the one I hate the most is called ground elder, which you know it's one of these things that it has runners. Oh. So if you pull it out, you know you might just be propagating it because you might leave a bit in there, or you sometimes you can't get the roots out. <clears throat> the garden was absolutely full of it. I thought that it was a ground cover. Cover. When I came here in I think 2012, I couldn't figure out why you used so much of it. Now I know. I pull ground of elder out of the garden every single day Ooh. with gusto. Um, and that was brought by the Romans. So Lovely. you know, invasive so much. species have been coming here since you know the 2000 years. The other thing is that um, when people do meadows here, they tend to just buy these standard meadow mixes. So with our, our meadow, we <clears throat> went out of our way, excuse me, to buy plugs of a, a local native that is native specifically to West Sussex. Um, and what we're, we're going to do is we're going to grow them to a good pot size and then plant them in the autumn so that we start developing our meadow to have more of what might have grown here naturally. But you, you, know, you still have the problem of global, global warming. So mm. even old natives might not work as well as some of the imports. Yeah. Um, Jermaine just wrote in, how many acres, hectares is the garden now? How many people are needed to maintain it? So we have five and a half, about five acres, including the business side of things. Um, one full-time gardener, one gardener two days a week. We have a volunteer, five, one volunteer each of five days. And then Mike and I get involved all the time. We spent most of Sunday brutalizing a huge <laughs> overgrown you. It was really fun. Um, we we also propagate our own plants. So some of the plants come from the garden and we do some from seeds. So there's, there's quite a lot going on in that side. It's always something to do. Um, do you want to tell people about your artist in residence? Oh, this is great. So um, I met a woman through the Chichester Chamber of Counts, uh, Commerce almost a year ago. And she said, Gwendolyn, I've never met this woman. She's one of these amazing people. You need an artist in residence and you should talk to Sue England. She's going to be on television tonight. She's one of the finalists in ITV's Landscape Gardener of the Year. Oh, and she lives down the road. She's only three miles away. So we watched it. She seemed really amazing. Um, she's an abstract artist, but she's also a graphic designer and printer. So she's come to painting later in life. And her, her paintings have been so interesting to watch her. She usually does ski, seascapes and sort of where horizon meets water, she sees horizons. Of course, there's none of that here. This has been a huge growing experience for her. Um, one of her posts, um, I think in, in the winter time, she was painting across the dry riverbeds and she posted it, she says, I couldn't help but put the textures in there. The, you know, one day I found her struggling with the pink and whites of a magnolia tree. She says it looks so chocolate box, but of course it's absolutely sensational. It's so much variation in what she, um, what she sees. We've had a lot of photographers in the garden. Yesterday we had two women here that do tiny weavings inspired by gardens they go to. So oh, each cool. time you have somebody like this in the garden, you're seeing what they're seeing. You're, you're seeing the garden through different eyes. And I, I find that so fascinating. Yeah, that's great. I think we have time for one more question. Does Denman have, Denman's have any vegetables? Um, we have a herb garden, herb garden. And now after seven years, can't say it without the H. Um, <laughs> And I, we have a little private allotment that um, we have no idea what we're doing in, but we have a lot of fun with. Um, but we don't grow any vegetables per se. Well, I think we've come to the end of the hour. I wanna thank everyone for joining us. Let me show you this great book. And the nice thing about this book also, the pages are very slick. So if you take it out in the garden, you probably won't ruin the pages. And it's small enough to put in your wagon or just carry with you. It's very informative. And Barrett Bookstore has it. I can't thank Gwendolyn enough for joining us this morning. It's her afternoon and she's probably ready to get back out. And Oh, it's raining. You're not going to the garden. I'm thrilled to be talking to you today. <laughs>
Well, I hope people get to go to Denman's website, find out all about it, plan a trip. It is, it is so beautiful and so much fun to be in that area. There's so much to do. So thank you for sharing your afternoon with us. And I hope the sun comes out soon. Thank you very much. Come visit. I, I will. see you, you in know. September. All right, sweetheart. See you thank soon. You. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.